Hi, welcome to session three of the SQL MR webinar series. My name is Eric Friedman. In this session, we'll be talking about how to write a SQL MR function. So this is the overview of what we'll be talking about. Uh, first, we're going to review some of the topics that appeared in an earlier session, uh, particularly how a SQL MR function integrates with SQL. Then we'll be talking about the execution model uh, for a SQL MR function. This is from a developer's perspective, how one programs um, a SQL MR function. And uh, finally, I'll give an example of a simple SQL MR function um, that performs sessionization. Uh, this is a problem that we discussed in the first session of the webinar series. Uh, so first I'll talk about uh, SQL MR and how it integrates with SQL, just to review. So SQL MR functions are essentially integrated into queries, and they act like a table. So a SQL MR function acts like a table. It can be joined, filtered, aggregated, and so on. So here I'm showing a select from the function, but I could always, if I wanted to, join this to another table, have a filter, like a where clause, and so on. Uh, we talked about this earlier in the series. One thing that's different about a SQL MR function, of course, from a table is that it can use its own custom logic to decide what output it produces, but also it can dynamically decide the columns in its output. Uh, this is a feature that we refer to as dynamic polymorphism, and I'll talk more about that later. So just going through the, the clauses quickly of a SQL MR function, we have the on clause, which specifies the input rows. So this can be a table name, a subquery, or another SQL MR function. The partition by clause, is for certain SQL MR functions that want to operate on groups of rows. So the partition by clause specifies how rows will be grouped into partitions. Uh, the order by clause is a list of expressions just like a normal order by clause, but it specifies how the rows of the input within each partition will be ordered. Uh, in addition to the standard clauses, on partition by and order by, a function may have custom argument clauses. The name and meaning of arguments are function specific, and I'll show how these can be used uh, in the example later on. So now I'll talk about the execution model of uh, SQL MR and how one needs to think about writing a SQL MR function. So as we just discussed, SQL integration makes it easy to have variations compared to traditional MapReduce. For example, one can have a reduce by itself, uh, a map, a map, a map, and reduce, and so on. And really any sort of variation here can be easily and flexibly described using the SQL syntax that we discussed. Uh, and just to make a correspondence for, for those who are listening who are familiar with traditional MapReduce, we call map functions as row functions. Uh, essentially, these are uh, functions that operate on some subset of rows from a table. And for each input row, they output zero or more output rows. And this essentially is useful to enable row-level transformation and processing. In terms of what traditional MapReduce calls a reduce function, we actually call that a partition function. And this is when one specifies a partition by clause to operate on a group of rows at a time. For example, if one wants to consider all the records for each customer ordered by time, one can say partition by and order by when invoking a function. And uh, we saw examples of this in the second session when we discussed the NPath SQL MR function. And like a row function, uh, for each input partition in this case, uh, the function may output zero or more output rows. So for instance, the function will be considering all the rows for a given user or a given customer. And for each of these groups of rows, the function can examine them and then decide to output zero or more rows. Now, just to, to show this visually, we can see on the left a row function. And what this is trying to show here in the graphic is that the, the function sees sort of each row independently. It will see the first row, then the second row, then the third row. And logically, 
the processing of each row is independent. By contrast, a partition function sees full groups of rows. So on the right, we can see sort of a visualization of this, where in the first group, and here we're partitioning by user ID, one can see all the rows for a given user ID 238909. And then there's a separate group that's processed independently by the function, and that's shown at the bottom. So an important topic for a SQL MR function, especially compared to other databases implementation of user-defined functions, is a distinction that we make between function initialization and function runtime. SQL MR functions are invoked in two modes. There is an initialize mode, and at a high level, what happens in the initialize mode is the function can examine information about how it will be invoked that the query planner at the end cluster queen node tells the function about. So if a function is invoked on a table that has five columns and their names are A, B, C, D, E, and one has an integer type, another has a varchar type, and so on, this information will be provided to the function at initialize mode. And in turn, the function tells the planner about its output. And this can happen dynamically. The metaphor here is one of completing a contract. Essentially, the function is being told how it's going to be invoked, and in turn, the function is promising to have a certain kind of output at runtime. In runtime mode is once the contract has been completed and the planner has been made aware of the output that the function will have, each worker in N cluster will invoke a function instance, and the worker will provide input rows that have been specified in the on clause of the SQLMR function query. As we discussed before, with a partition by clause, the input rows will actually be grouped into partitions in which case the function won't be processing a row at a time, but will be able to process the entire group as a whole. And in both cases, whether it's a row function or a partition function, the function provides output rows. And of course, along with the metaphor of a contract, the output that the function produces must satisfy the contract that was agreed to during initialize mode. Now, so to make this a little bit more concrete, we can look at the uh, high level of what writing a function might look like. In terms of the Java API, one first needs to make a choice to implement either a row function or a partition function. And again, going back to the earlier discussion, the way one decides this is whether the function logically needs to operate on a row at a time, independently of other rows, or whether the function needs to operate on groups of rows that have been grouped together by some common value that's specified by the partition by clause. So once uh, a decision is made whether to implement the row function or partition function interface, one needs to implement two additional methods at minimum. Uh, first is the constructor for the function class. So in this example here at the bottom, we see a class named foo, which would correspond to some function that is called foo. And it needs to have a, a constructor that takes in a runtime contract and its responsibility in the constructor is to examine the contract, which has been partially completed, to decide its own output and then to complete the contract, essentially promising how it's going to operate when it's invoked at runtime. And then at runtime, there is an operate on some rows or operate on partition method, depending on whether it's a row function or a partition function. And this is going to be given an iterator that can be used to access the rows that are in the input and an emitter that can be used to produce the output rows. 